This is a great show. I know. We've really got some competition out there. Hello there, podcast listener. Hey, if you want another great show to listen to that tackles hot topics in marketing, social media, public relations, and corporate communication, well, then we'd love it if you added Hanson and Hunt to your list of favorite podcasts. I'm Eric Hanson. And I'm Kevin Hunt. And we are Hanson and Hunt. And just like this show, we are part of the Marketing Podcast Network. So check us out sometime. Hanson and Hunt, available on your favorite podcast app. This podcast is coming to you on MPN, the Marketing Podcast Network. There's another show on MPN you might want to check out. I'm Dave Delaney, the host of The Nice Podcast. Each episode is about communication, collaboration, and becoming better leaders of today's fastest growing tech companies. Subscribe to The Nice Podcast today. It'll make your marketing that much smarter. Just visit nicepodcast.co or search for The Nice Podcast with Dave Delaney wherever you get your podcasts. I'm Nick Westergaard, and this is On Brand, helping you tell your story. My guest this week is Rob Meyerson. Everybody thinks they can come up with a name because we all uh, speak the language or speak some language, and uh, you know we deal with words every day. That's that's just part of life. Whereas uh, a designer, to sit, you know, a lot of people think I can't draw, I can't, I don't know what looks good, and so there is this respect and do respect put on designers um, that they're the experts. Let's let's let them do the logo work. But when it comes to a name, I mean, that's just a word. Anybody can do that, right? And I think that's the misunderstanding that gets a lot of people into trouble. Rob Meyerson is a namer, brand consultant, and principal and founder of Heirloom, an independent brand strategy and identity firm. Prior to founding Heirloom, Rob's previous roles included head of brand architecture and naming at HP, director of verbal identity at Interbrand in San Francisco, and director of strategy at Future Brand in Southeast Asia. His past clients range from Fortune 500 to Silicon Valley startups from San Francisco to Shanghai, including brands such as Adobe, AT&T, GE, John Deere, Disney, Guitar Hero, Intel, Meta, Facebook, Microsoft, Walmart, and Yahoo. An experienced namer, Rob has created names for companies CoreLight, nonprofits like Swing Left, products Sierra Wireless Octave, and services. Rob has written about brand strategy and brand naming for leading publications such as Entrepreneur, TechCrunch, Insider, The Guardian, VentureBeat, and Branding Strategy Insider. Rob, Welcome to On Brand. Thanks, Nick. It's great to be here. You know, I am excited for this conversation. I've I've had your book, Brand Naming, sitting on my my desk for a while, and been looking forward to it because it really seems like, uh, I mean, both on this podcast and I'd say within the discipline of of branding itself, I, I feel like we don't talk about brand naming enough. Uh, maybe you spend all of your time there, but I, I don't know what, what, how you th- think about that. Yeah, it's funny to, to hear you say that because, of course, I've been talking about it quite a lot for, for quite a long time. But I suppose you're right. The reason I do that is because uh, I feel that it is um, perhaps an underappreciated uh, piece of the branding puzzle. It really is. And uh, and I feel like it's, you know, I was trying to back as far out as I could get. I mean, I suppose a logo maybe, but I feel like compared to the logo, which we give all kinds of attention to, <laughs> uh, naming is, is, is just as important, just as early of a touch point and can have just as big an impact. But why... Why, why, why all the logo attention and and not as much for naming? <laughs> well, I, yeah, I mean, first off, I completely agree. I, I would point out that uh, the logo changes, which is part of why it gets attention. Because every time there's a big logo redesign, um, that gets attention in the industry and sometimes even outside the industry, whether that's for good reasons or bad. Uh, the name typically doesn't change. Uh, that's you know that's what will stay the same when uh, when IBM or Apple uh, or, or Coca-Cola. I know these are brands that don't make big logo changes all that often, but 
even when they make a tiny tweak to something, uh, that'll be news in the industry. But of course, those names have have been with us for uh, over 100 years in, in some cases. Um, and so I'd argue the importance of the name, uh, part of it stems from that that lack of change. And if you are changing the name, then that's probably something pretty drastic that's happened, either uh, something really bad or in some cases an acquisition or, or a merger, which, which could be good, um, but still a pretty dramatic shift in, in the business and in the brand. That's a that's a really interesting point between those two very important touch points is that you know a, like you said a logo is 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 surface level it can change I mean that's was the first thing you just said but a name is something really foundational and if you're changing it you're absolutely right something big has happened like you said yeah. either yeah. either bad uh, or, or potentially good in, in terms of, uh, of of growth. I also think when when we say we don't talk about it enough that it's a process that's not understood. And I feel like you know you get people just pulling ideas left, mm-hmm. right, center all over the place without much much process to it. So, I guess the first big question is, is where do you start with naming? Well, really quickly, I think what you just said is actually another really good reason that that there's so much attention paid to logos or maybe a, a disparity in the amount of respect, let's say, um, <laughs> that a logo designer might get is that I think – uh, everybody thinks they can come up with a name because we all uh, speak the language or speak some language and uh, you know we deal with words every day that's that's just part of life whereas uh, a designer to sit you know a lot of people think I can't draw I can't I don't know what looks good and so there is this respect and do respect put on designers um, that they're the experts let's let's let them do the logo work but when it comes to a name I mean that's just a word anybody can do that right and I think that's that's the um, the misunderstanding that that gets a lot of people into trouble startup founders um, uh, or even people in, in big businesses that are naming new products is they think well let's just have a brainstorming session and throw a couple of words on a whiteboard and we'll pick our favorite one and we're done um, and unfortunately that doesn't usually work for a number of reasons um, so let's come back to that when we talk about the process more, but to answer your initial question, where, where should the process start? It's actually with an, a brief, um, similar to a logo or a lot of other creative deliverables. You need uh, a creative brief that documents for you and whoever else you're working with, whether that's a client or other people on your team, exactly what do we want this name to be? What kinds of words are going to work? What kinds of ideas would we want to express or avoid expressing? Even down into the nitty gritty of are there specific letters that we need to avoid for some reason? Or, uh, you know, what are the competitors named? And, and we need to make sure we're not too similar to those in any way. So getting all that documented and getting everyone to agree on it is the first step and one of the most important steps. So with that that brief of, of what you are, what you what you're trying to do, from there, it, it, you talk early on in the book about the kind of different types of names. And and stop me if I've jumped too far ahead in the process, too. Like I said, I don't think we we talk about this enough, but you talk about the difference in, in abstract and descriptive names. And I mm-hmm. feel like when people maybe don't have enough process behind this, they end up pretty, pretty squarely in one of those two camps and sometimes with uh, with a lot of attitude around why <laughs> they're there. I mean, and we think that maybe with the, the meat and potatoes descriptive camp, but I, I feel like the abstract camp has a lot of followers that maybe don't know exactly why they're in that camp. <laughs> Yeah, I, I talk about um, different name types along two different dimensions. And, and the one, the first is what you just described from descriptive. So a uh, company name like the Container Store or Pizza Hut, you, you know exactly what you're going there for. Um, they say it right in the name up to more abstract, which could be something like Apple 
which if you try to put yourself in the mindset of someone who's never heard of that company before, you have absolutely no idea what they do. You probably think that they sell fruit. Um, or it could be something like Dasani, which you have even less of an idea, you know, because it's not even a word that you've heard before. Um, and so that's the other dimension here for different name types is whether you, you're using real words or coined words, invented words like Dasani and Kodak and Sony are all just made up uh, words or something in between, which there's a, a category we called compound, which is two real words smushed together to make something like zip car. Um, there are a few other name types like acronyms, uh, different types of abbreviations, or sometimes just using uh, a foreign word, which is a type of real word, obviously, but it's a little bit of a different approach to to name uh, yourself after, to, to use Prego, let's say, for a spaghetti sauce. Even though that's an American brand, they chose an Italian word for for obvious reasons. So there are all these different approaches. And I think you're right. People people have very strong feelings, sometimes I think unfounded, about which of these is, is best. The, the short answer is that none of them are automatically better than any others, but they all have pros and cons and work best for different situations. So do you narrow the category down or do you or or do you like starting in one category or do you try right. different different types? Do you category yeah. jump? It, it depends a little bit. That That is something that I usually try to cover in the brief. But honestly, a lot of times, depending on, on the client. We'll say, let's just explore everything at first and we'll narrow it down based on what seems to be working and what doesn't. But there are reasons that you might narrow it down right at the beginning. I mean, it, it could just be preferences. Um, like you said, people have strong feelings. And, you know, I work in a consultative capacity. So if my client says, hey, I hate these made up words, I don't want anything like that, then OK, we're probably not going to explore <laughs> that much. Um, although I might I might throw one or two just to kind of test their their uh, their hypothesis there. Um, but it could also be looking at the competition. You know, we could see, hey, everybody here has these compound names like Zipcar and Fitbit. And it seems to be like a trend in our industry for some reason. Wouldn't it be nice to break away from that with just a simple real word or maybe something coined that just sounds really different? Um, so there is. Uh, a strategic aspect to naming that I, I think also is overlooked. It's not just about uh, a cool, creative, funky, uh, fun to say word. It's also thinking about strategy as we always do in branding. And a big part of that is what's the competitive set? How are we going to uh, stand apart from, from those other names? On Brand, we'll be right back after this. You're listening to this podcast advertisement, so you know they're effective, but knowing which podcasts align with your target audience is impossible, right? Not anymore. Pod Chaser Pro is the one-stop shop for all podcast data, like listener counts, demographic and geographic information, and contacts for thousands of the top podcasts across any topic or industry. Learn more at podchaserpro.com slash MPN today. That's podchaserpro.com slash MPN. Now back to the show. So you talked about some of the important steps that we need to take in in thinking about all of this, the, the competition and so forth. But you also, in the book, mentioned some pretty important steps that it's easy to sit and think, oh, well, duh, of course you do that. But <laughs> it doesn't happen. I'm, of course, talking yeah. about you have chapters on... Uh, trademark pre-screening, uh, right. linguistics. These are, uh, again, I'm going to say this probably 10 times, uh, we don't talk about naming enough. And it, it's because of this that we find ourselves in trouble in categories like uh, legal and linguistics. Sure. Yeah. Um, legal is something that I think most people, whether they work in branding or not, understand that you need to have a name that that you can, uh, in most cases, that you can uh, own from a, a trademark standpoint. Um, but I have, when I worked at HP and I was head of naming there, we would hire high-end naming agencies. And I've even had a high-end uh, agency that, that I won't name um, come in and present a bunch of name ideas to us for a, a company level name, you know, something really, really important. And we loved everything. We couldn't believe it. We thought these are the, these are great. And so I had this little 
kind of tickle in the back of my brain. And I said, are, are we going to be able to own any of these? Have you checked to make sure that nobody's using these? Because these names seem almost too good to be true. And and they looked at me and said, well, no, we, we skipped that step. <laughs> I thought, well, that's why all these names seem too good to yeah. be true. And, you know, and, and that'll happen. That happens at that uh, end, unfortunately, or it did in that case. But it, it's much more common for for amateurs to just think, you know, if I come up with uh, 10 ideas, surely one of them I can I can have. And they might, you know, people might be surprised to know that we generally come up with hundreds or even over a thousand ideas for any given project. I've seen, depending on what you're naming, I've seen 90 percent of names uh, not be available. Uh, I've worked in, in industries where uh, you think you have the most obscure idea and nobody nobody's ever come up with this. It's so it's so strange, but it's you know, it's really interesting and it could work. And nope, somebody somewhere in the world has it. And and, you know, whether or not that's an issue is is a question eventually for a trademark attorney. But the, the critical step that a lot of people skip is before they go to that attorney is just doing what I call a preliminary trademark check. So uh, there are free uh, publicly available databases from uh, the U.S. Trademark uh, and Patent Office. You can just Google things a lot of times and see, oh, there's some company that's using that name for a very similar uh, product. And so. Uh, the chances that that you know that they get upset are are pretty high, and so it'd be a mistake to do this. So weeding out those obvious conflicts before you get too far into the process is a really critical step that that is unfortunately sometimes glossed over. And speaking of steps we gloss over, uh, I should have lumped this in there. There's a there's just a, a slew of useful chapters there in the book because right up there with it, you mentioned owning this and searching for things. You've got the domain in there, so right. I mean, this happens all the time. I I can say with confidence because I know it's happened <laughs> to me, where you've got something, it clears every other hurdle, and then uh the the darn domain thing yeah, so the, the so dot com will be taken <laughs> yeah yeah so so is it a deal breaker what what what's what's your so, thinking there yeah so this is um this is probably one of the parts of the book that's maybe a little contentious and and i will so i'll acknowledge that there is uh disagreement on this although i believe that the majority of professional namers who, who do this for a living are are aligned on this that it is not a deal breaker. I think that's the best way to put it. I mean, sure, getting the exact.com is great. Um, the domain is important in this day and age. But generally speaking, um, adding a little descriptor at the end of the name. So uh, if you're naming, uh, let's take another f made up fruit name here. Let's say you're pineapple uh, microchips, then adding microchip at the end of the name and getting pineapple microchip or pineapple chips or pineapple computing.com. Um, it's going to be a pretty good solution. And this is a lot of this is because these days we're no longer trying to type in exact.coms into an address bar. We've all kind of evolved to uh, to work with, with Chrome or Google uh, in a way that we just kind of type what we think we're looking for. And it, it pretty much pops up for us now, thanks to the, the power of these search engines. And so uh, that's that need to get a great dot com has really diminished or I should say to get a perfect dot com has really diminished, I think, for the majority of categories and, and brands out there. Well, those those extension descriptors and thinking of search, too, I think is is really smart. What, what you just said there, uh, like what someone's searching for. I know with with my books, uh, you know, my first one was Get Scrappy, and I my domain that I I direct folks to there is Get Scrappy Book, mm -hmm. and you know, it, it seems to me that that would fit that requirement that you just talked about of of what people are gonna, you know, what they might add on in in a search, and that that's not. You see it, I mean, all all over the place. I mean, there's some common ones that people use for like, it seems like the, the marketing focused ones like uh, get XYZ app yes. dot com and so forth. Exactly. And I have a list of those in the book. There are, there are words you can put before. So get or try or we are a lot of times for an agency. I see, you know, we are whatever the agency name is dot com. Um, and so I think those are all great. I think where there are industry standards, so putting book at the end of a book name or putting movie even at the end of a movie name right. um, has become pretty common. And, and I did the same thing, brandnamingbook.com. 
um, just to get the URL in there. <laughs> yeah. Um, but uh, yeah, I think there are these these sort of standard solutions. There are, of course, other top level domains that are that are not as that don't have the same cachet. But of course, you could use a dot net or a .org, and depending on you know what you're doing, it might be a, may, might make more sense to use a .edu or something like that. And we have all these new TLDs. There's uh, there's dot coffee dot motorcycles <laughs> dot heirloom. My agency is I, I went ahead and bought heirloom dot agency as well um, because I just figured it's another way that people might find me. And so you mentioned SEO, and I, I'm not an SEO expert, but I, I think that one of the things I've said is you know sometimes you can get that exact dot com for, but it's just got a hefty price tag on it. And I would say instead of uh, ponying up the thirty thousand dollars to get that exact dot com just get that simpler dot com with a descriptor in it and then put some of that money towards seoing the the website that you've built so that people can find you more easily so you mentioned agencies uh, a a while back and i want to also mention the the other great thing in in the book that i'm sure a lot of agency listeners are gonna gonna be excited about is the idea of presenting names because boy it's i mean logos too but it's it's tricky presenting identity concepts Uh, what what are some of the best practices around around this yeah so that's that's a great point and that's another i think really critical chapter in the book that i I feel like has not been uh detailed as much as it probably should i i I like to say that you know coming up with a bunch of really creative and interesting name ideas is is actually a much smaller part of the battle than you would think because ultimately it's not about a lot of great ideas it's about a single idea that has actually been agreed upon and that often is the hardest part so presenting is where we manage a lot of the emotions that swirl around naming some of the politics that can uh, infect the process Uh, If you're dealing with a team or even three people, three founders that have to agree on something that can seem really subjective and that they may bring their own emotional baggage into, you know, we all have associations with words um, and maybe it sounds like something we experienced early in our life, another business or a person that we didn't have a a good (laughs) relationship with. And so none of that should impact the name. I think, you know, it's, it's pretty obvious from a from a, a rational level uh, or a strategic level, but of course it, it can because we're emotional people. And so setting up the presentation in the right way is is critical. And uh, I have a lot in this chapter about really teeing things up, priming your audience, explaining to them what they're about to see, explaining to them some of the mistakes people make when they try to evaluate names. Um, so people often expect, for example, that the best name will simply jump off the page, so to speak, that, you know, I'm going to show you 15 ideas and one of them, they think, will just scream at them, oh my God, that's the perfect name. And everybody will agree unanimously, of course, that's the best name and we're done. And that just doesn't happen. Even if you're lucky enough that one of them really speaks to you, the idea of it also being the same one for everybody else in the room, if you're dealing with a team, the odds are almost zero. And so you have to be ready to accept that some of these ideas could work strategically. Let's stay open minded. uh, And you have to be able to be flexible and find one that works the best, as opposed to expecting that, you know, that single perfect name to jump off the page. That's so key. So many things that you just said. I I also like the idea of not presenting just a big list of names. And I feel (laughs) like taking that into uh, uh, a meeting, I feel like that's a a way that this process, uh, one of the many ways this process can can go wrong instead of focusing that, instead of getting that, as, as you talk about earlier, book, narrowing it down. I, I think going into uh, the meeting with the stakeholders, with the great big uh, unnarrowed list is 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 a mistake and is going to, like you said, the idea that everybody's going to, uh, that, that the one name's going to jump out to everybody is, um, is, is a tangled mess. Right. A couple of, of sort of classic no-nos for namers. Um, don't just email a list of names and say, you know, here's my 
here's my 10 favorite ideas. Which one do you want to pick? Um, that doesn't work. So even just getting to the presentation, doing a presentation is, is one of the biggest things here, making it feel more formal, making it feel, making it clear that thought and work has gone into these names and that it wasn't just your first off the cuff ideas. All of that is part of managing the psychology of this decision making. So I do have slides typically in presentations up front that say, you know, we came up with a thousand ideas. We're showing you the best 20 um, that have been through all of this, this vetting. Um, just to give people the the idea there that we we had a lot of ideas. The reason we're showing you these is because we think they're the best and because they've made it through this. So that sort of short circuits that knee jerk reaction that you sometimes get of, oh, you know, I, I see these these twenty that you're showing me, but have you thought of this? What about this? You know, I, I have yeah. a few more ideas. What about these? And a lot of times I can tell clients if they do go down that road. Oh, yep, we thought of that one. <laughs> you know, yeah. unfortunately, it wasn't available. Um, and, and to your point, uh, I also, I, I don't like to, to share that longer list of the hundreds and hundreds of ideas. It's, it's just so overwhelming, um, that it can really cause that, uh, paralysis by analysis. And, and given that we're trying to get to a decision here, um, that's the wrong way to go. Rob, I want to, uh, before we segue into the brand that has made you smile, I want to see if we can get some naming quick hits. And it doesn't have to be it doesn't have to be a, a big a big thesis on the the why you're choosing it, but I, I want to in teeing up that <laughs> smile go for a, a brand name that you think wow that's great really knocked it out of the park, and then maybe if we can uh, not maybe put it uh, on too too awkward of a ground maybe say boy that could have been done better <laughs> so. Do, do you have one that you sure. cite that's like your go-to? That's 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 an awesome name. Yeah, I have a few in the book, and I've mentioned Apple already, which I think everybody you know puts a lot of love on for <clears throat> not just the name, but you know everything about the brand. I'm gonna I'm gonna say Swiffer um, because it's such a you know it's it's such a, such an inglorious product. Um, <laughs> But I have to give a lot of credit here to a naming agency called Lexicon, who developed that name, and that they're also the the agency behind some of the greats, uh, Pentium, Sonos. They named Zima back in the day. Um, Swiffer, I think, is just a, an ingenious use of speech sounds. So even though that's a made up word, it immediately conveys something about a, a sweeping motion, uh, maybe a, a cleaning. Uh, product of some sort. And so I love that name. It also, speaking of distinctiveness, every other name in the space had mop in the name. So they went up against the ready mop and the quick mop and all these other things. And they, I think, hit it out of the park with this really distinctive uh, coined word that has some inherent meaning and feels like a real word. That's one of the things we look for uh, with these coined words is that it doesn't feel like some concocted uh, invented like a, a robot or AI came up with it. It feels like Swiffer. That could be a real word. I'm sure I've heard that somewhere and you almost know what it means before you've been told. And bonus points because you can turn it into a verb. I mean, we, yes. we talk about someone needs to, you know, Swiffer the dining room. <laughs> yep. Yep. I'm sure whoever has to do that's not happy about it, but it has to happen sometimes. And, uh, it's probably easier with that product than, uh, without it. Um, the, the names that, that don't work so well, I, I also list some. And this is a little harder um, because sometimes names fail not necessarily because of the name, but because of a, a really mishandled launch of the name. Um, and and I, I describe a few of those in the book and go into detail on on why. But but one that I think is, is just pretty bad across the board is Tronk. And Tronk was a relatively short-lived renaming of Tribune Online Content, the uh, the Tribune news company. Um, shortened Tribune Online Content to Tronk. They made a big deal out of this. They created a, unfortunately, also a pretty ugly logo for it. And that name, you know, I talk about a lot of different reasons that names can be uh, bad, for lack of a better word. But really, I think what does that one in it, it I know it's subjective, but it just sounds gross. It sounds it's silly at best, right? Um, yeah. But it just, you know, it sounds really strange. You have no idea what it is or what it means. Um, when you find out what it means, I, my sort of reaction is, oh, why didn't you just say that instead of shortening it into something that nobody could ever understand? And so 
I, I imagine that's part of why after a couple of years of um, being made fun of quite a bit in the branding community and outside of the branding community, they, they just got rid of it and switched back to Tribune online content. I'm so glad you said that. There was so much we didn't have time to to get to in 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 our interview here, but the the mishandled launch I think is an important thing to point to, and and mm-hmm. a cautionary tale in and of itself because sometimes it's it's not a bad name. Sometimes it's a it's a it's a clumsy launch. It's not. And you could do it with logos too. Um, right. So right. So let's let's go with the easy question. What's a brand that has made you? Theoretically easy. A brand that has made you <laughs> smile recently. Well, another one of my favorite names uh, is Recess, which is a sparkling CBD beverage. And from the second I saw this, I think it's five, six, maybe maybe even older than that, five or six years old. Um, and from, as a branding person, you'll love it. Just the the color palette, the just they, they really, you can tell they have a love of design, the way they've handled things. The name to me, uh, is great. It speaks to taking a break. It's really nostalgic for, um, you know, running outside on the playground. And, uh, and so I, I think they nailed it with the name and, uh, and all of the branding and I actually enjoy the product as well. So, uh, I would say recess is a brand that's made me smile. That is awesome. Love when we hear about new fun brands like recess. <laughs> Rob, where can folks go? We already said it, but uh, but we were talking about it. But where can folks go to learn more about who you are and what you do? Sure. So the book is uh, for sale on Amazon, of course. But if you want to learn more about it, you can go to brandnamingbook.com. You can also go to robmeyerson.com. That's M-E-Y-E-R-S-O-N. And from there, you'll see links to not only the book, but also my agency, Heirloom. Uh, some of the things I've been writing, uh, other kind of appearances that I've done. And so that's probably the best one-stop shop. Awesome. And we'll link up to that in our show notes, which you can find, and I'm going to do it again because it happened with the podcast, at (laughs) onbrandpodcast.com. It's everywhere. Rob, (laughs) thanks for being on brand with us. Thanks, Nick. It was fun. And if you like what you're hearing, if we've made you smile, Remember, you can listen free on Apple, Spotify, or whatever your favorite platform may be. Brand names are everywhere. I'm overthinking them. Until next week, I'm Nick Westergaard, and I'll see you on the internet. This podcast is heard along the Marketing Podcast Network. For more great marketing podcasts, visit marketingpodcasts.net.